Hello and welcome. Let me get everything set up here. Um, <clears throat> today we are going to do uh, a lecture about Islam. Okay, now try to get this where I need it. Do do do. Okay, <clears throat> so um, this lecture you will uh, see. I hope uh, your papers are going well. Again, if you have any concerns about that, please be in touch with me. Now, one of the things that we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the origins of Islam. We're going to look at the expansion of Islam through the ancient world. And we're going to try to get a very basic understanding of how Islam works as a religion. Now, as I do these, whether they're Christianity or Islam, again, this is not a religious context. I'm not trying to persuade you to be a Muslim. I just want to give you some information to increase what we call religious literacy, all right? So that you understand how these religions work. And one of the main things that I'm gonna be talking to you about today, all right, is the similarities and the interconnected nature between the three Abrahamic religions, all right? Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Now we live in a modern world in which these religions do not seem very connected, all right? They are often having conflicts with each other. And a lot of that originates really back in uh, about the 11th century with the Crusades. But it's very important to understand that Islam is the youngest of these three faiths, but they are all very closely connected, all right? Religions begin as tiny seeds and they grow based on where that religion expands through. So the differences between Christianity and Islam are largely explained uh, because of where Islam grew up versus where Christianity grew up. Okay, so here we go. Sorry, my allergies are really bad today, so I may itch uh, my nose. Okay. Um, ah, come back, okay. So one of the things that I want you to really think about when we do this lecture on Islam, okay, or what are some of the preconceived notions that I have about Islam? And we all have, all right? Um, and kind of where do these come from? All right, especially if you are, as I am, all right, a citizen of the United States living here, uh, we have had a very conflicted relationship uh, with Islam really for a long time. And the West uh, has been a part of that fight. So we need to try to, as I always want you to, okay, try to take off our 21st century thinking caps, all right, and try to be open to understanding, um, again, the origins of where Islam came from and what it means within our story. All right, uh, next week we're gonna talk about uh, Al-Andalus, which is Islam uh, in Spain, which is really fascinating and fun. And I wanna do a lecture this week because that week, next week, um, you can watch a video on that. That's a lot more fun than I am. So, okay, we wanna think carefully about our preconceived notions and then we wanna try to kind of get them out of the way. I know it's hard. It's pretty much impossible, but uh, let's try anyway, all right? Okay. Now, first of all, all right, um, Islam is what we call one of the Abrahamic faiths, okay? Um, it is first and foremost monotheistic, all right? Just like Christianity, um, just like Judaism. It is a monotheistic faith, and Muslims trace the beginning of their faith back to Abraham and Ishmael. Now, Ishmael is one of Abraham's sons, and very importantly, um, Muslims regard uh, both Christianity uh, and Judaism, all right, as other manifestations of God that came before Islam. Okay, so they don't say that those things are wrong or incorrect. They simply say they were number one, number two, and we're number three. 
All right. Muslims believe uh, that Muhammad, who we'll talk about in a minute, is the last and the final chapter in uh, the same God's revelation to human beings. Okay, so Muslims believe in the same God that Jews do, the same God that Christians do. Now, there are differences, all right? Uh, for example, Muslims believe that Jesus was not divine, all right? Muhammad is not divine. Um, they were simply prophets, all right? People that God chose to talk to. And again, for uh, Muslims, all right, Muhammad is the last prophet. It's the final revelation that God gives to mankind in God's uh, attempt to get us to sort of uh, fly right, right? We are errant people, we keep doing silly things, and God keeps trying to, through his use of prophets, get us to act correctly. Now, very importantly, again, um, Muslims believe that Jews and Christians are dine, not dine, um, different words, sounds similar. Uh, Jews and Christians are people of the book, and that was very important to early Muslims. All right, these people of the book were separate from a group that Muslims called pagans. And pagans were anybody that wasn't Jewish or Christian. And largely, uh, Muslims regarded them as a sort of great threat to Islam. So initially, we start off without that much conflict between these three religions. Again, the conflict develops over time as Islam spreads out, as Christianity grows in power in Europe. Okay. <clears throat> now, it's important to understand um, where Islam comes from, because it's very important. So here we have a map of the ancient Middle East. Again, you should see up there the Tigris and the Euphrates River Valley, our friend uh, Gilgamesh down on the part of the Euphrates in Ur. You see uh, Judea there on the Mediterranean Sea. All right, ancient homeland of the Jewish people. Now, this big part right down here is the Arabian Peninsula. And all the way up through the beginning of the seventh century, all right, the 600s or so, all of the other conquering armies had not conquered the Arabian Peninsula. And there's a very simple reason for that. It is a giant desert. It is hard to get across. That being said, all right, the Arabian Peninsula sits between aspects of the Indian Ocean, the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, and the Mediterranean. And this meant that one way in which people in this part of the world made their money was as a caravan. All right, a caravan meant that basically people in the Arabian Peninsula figured out that camels are very adept at crossing the desert. They're very cantankerous animals, but uh, otherwise they're very good for taking things across the desert. All right, and a lot of Arabian society is based on an economic model of taking things from the Persian Gulf over to the Mediterranean. All right, uh, spices over here from India, all kinds of different things. Now, pre-Islam, the Arabian Peninsula was a relatively chaotic and violent place. All right. Um, it was mostly populated by people, and it still is, that we call Bedouins. All right. Now, Bedouins were semi-nomadic in that they would have large tents that they would set up at different points in the desert. All right, they were masters at the domestication of the camel, the beginning of the caravan trade, and they were also very fierce warriors. Now, they were governed by this certain set of laws, all right, which promoted uh, a masculine ideal. It was a very, very masculine society um, of bravery in battle. My favorite one, patience in misfortune persistence in revenge. Um, you have the protection of the weak, all right? The men were supposed to be fierce warriors. They protected the women and children and the old, all right? But it was a very, very uh, violent and chaotic way to have a society, all right? When you have a code of uh, masculine fighting and manliness like this, um, there's not a lot of peace and stability. All right, people moved around a lot. Um, 
the strongest were able to take political power. Now, the Bedouins also have this peculiar sort of love of poetry, all right, which you can sort of juxtapose to their um, relatively violent society. Now, this is the ancient world, so a lot of places are violent. I don't mean to pick them out as it, but um, it was a rough and tumble place. So this is just a, you know, kind of cheesy picture of a Bedouin. Obviously, Bedouins wore um, various kinds of garments in order to protect themselves from the scorching uh, sun uh, in the desert. Okay, now, we know a little bit more about Muhammad as an individual than we know about somebody like Moses or Abraham or Jesus. And a lot of that has to do with the fact um, that Muhammad, as the founder of Islam, wears a lot more hats, all right? Uh, one of the major differences with Islam is that there really is no separation between religious leadership and political leadership. And one of the things about Muhammad was that he was a very good administrator, a very good mover of men, all right? He was a military commander, and he was a religious prophet. So, um, Muhammad grows up, all right? Um, he loses both his parents at a very young age, and he's largely raised by his uncle. Now, his uncle gets him a job as a caravan driver, all right, which was one of the best jobs, really, that you could have. Um, and what it meant is, again, he would take these uh, items, spices, things of great value, and he would have a big caravan full of camels, and he would take them across the desert over to the Mediterranean side of the ancient world and sell things. Now, this is important because while Muhammad was illiterate, and we'll talk about why that's important later, he had a lot of contact with different kinds of people, all right? He saw rich merchants. Uh, he would have come into contact with Jews, with Christians, with Bedouins, all kinds of different people. Now, he marries, all right? He marries a very interesting woman, an older woman named Kaditha. And what is important about her is that she actually owns her own caravan, which again, in this very male dominated world would have been almost unheard of. And that she's older than Muhammad. That was, uh, that was different. Now, as Muhammad grows into his thirties, okay, he begins to become disenchanted with the world that he sees around him. He sees a lot of differences between the rich and the poor, all right? You have a very rich merchant class that's living a very hedonistic lifestyle, obsessed with drinking, gambling, sex. Uh, I know some of you are probably like, yeah, what's the problem? That sounds great. But he sees this lifestyle as fundamentally hollow and unsatisfying. There's something he's not getting from it. He also sees this great separation between rich and poor. He sees a lot of people who are poor, a lot of people who are struggling, and he sees that the rich don't really care about these people, right? It's a very cruel society in that way. Now, from what we know about Muhammad, and again, we don't have a lot of secondary source material, but we do have more than we have on some other religious figures. Um, one month out of the year, all right, before the revelations, even, um, Muhammad would kind of take some personal time, all right? And I always joke that his wife must have loved the fact that he just took a whole month for himself, but hey. And um, he would take this time and he would go up into a cave, all right, that is uh, still there, you can, you can visit it. And he would sit in silence. And it was sort of a meditative practice. All right, being a caravan driver was stressful. You were going all over the place. You were seeing all these things. Sometimes you got attacked, you had to fight. So for this one month, one lunar month, he would take time and he would sit in this cave in silence and he would think and he would meditate. We don't really know. So when he was 40 years old, all right, as the story goes in Islam, he was sitting in the cave, minding his own business when a figure appeared to him. Now, the figure 
as told to us uh, through Islam, okay, was the angel, the archangel Gabriel. So again, one of the things that Islam does, right, is it is using sort of the building blocks of other religions, all right? It is really speaking in the language of a Judeo-Christian um, vision, basically. So um, Gabriel appears to Muhammad, all right? And he has a, a flaming sword and he has a scroll. And he puts the scroll in front of Muhammad and he says, recite. Now, as you can imagine, I don't know if you've ever had a vision. I, I really haven't one like this. Um, this must have been fairly terrifying. We also know, right, that uh, Muhammad couldn't read. So Muhammad says, and again, literacy was not very common in the ancient world. Uh, probably 99% of most societies were illiterate, right? So Muhammad's kind of shocked, right? He says, I can't read, I don't know. And Gabriel then wraps the scroll around Muhammad's neck and starts to choke him with it until finally Muhammad recites. Now, over the next several years, all right, Muhammad would kind of go into these uh, sort of trances or fits and he would recite. These recitations over many years, all right, are collected into what we know as the Quran. Now the Quran is made up of uh, chapters, we call them surahs, and uh, they are of varying lengths. I believe they get shorter as they go on. And one of the things that Muslims definitely believe is that the Quran is written in Arabic, and in Arabic is the word of God. Therefore, recitation of the Quran is very important in Islam. Literally saying those words is believed to have healing properties and is believed to be getting in touch with, um, with God, basically. Now, largely because of that, Islam does not have a particular sort of literary and critical tradition when it comes to the Quran. All right, this is different than uh, Judaism and most parts of Christianity, right, who are sort of fascinated by you know, where did biblical text come from? How was it put together? How was it developed over hundreds of years? Um, that's not so much going on in Islam. Um, and we'll talk about some other books that they have and other things. All right, so he continues to receive these visions and he collects them over time. Now, the first people to, um, you know, kind of be hip to what he was doing, um, are his wife, all right, his close family members. Now, he's currently living, all right, in the city of Mecca. And the thing about the city of Mecca um, is that even pre-Islam, it was a pilgrimage site, all right? And um, So, pilgrimage sites, right, are very economically beneficial to the people who live in the pilgrimage site. Um, the main, again, early converts, all right, Muhammad's wife, um, Ali, all right, who is Muhammad's cousin, Abu Bakr, okay, who was a close friend of Muhammad, who really kind of, uh, you know, raised him. Um, and Muhammad would eventually marry his daughter. The point is that Muhammad begins to preach a new kind of religion, all right? A religion that uh, rejects drinking, rejects gambling, rejects paganism. And while this is okay at first, right, the people who run Mecca, Medina, begin to tire of it, okay? Because basically uh, he is telling people that the paganism that makes this town a bunch of money is not right anymore. Now here's where things get interesting, okay? The reason people came throughout the peninsula to come to Mecca, all right, as they do still, uh, okay, was the kebab. 
Now, this is a large meteorite, a giant black stone. And pre-Islam, it was surrounded by 360 idols. And if you were going to take a big caravan across the desert, what you would do is you would come here, okay? You would visit this, you would ask the idols for help, and hopefully, you know, everything went okay. Now, um, Muhammad's message of only one God, right, really didn't jive with what was going on, and it was going to get in the way of the people who make money on people coming to pilgrimage to the site, all right? Now, Muhammad becomes unpopular, okay? Now, he's shielded a little bit because of his uncle, Abu Talib, who was part of a very influential clan in Mecca. But over time, Muhammad begins to convert a few more people. People become very uncomfortable with him. And eventually, basically, they drive him out of Mecca. Now, uh, this is the Kaaba, all right? This is a modern, relatively modern picture of it, all right? And Mecca has remained an important part of the Islamic faith, as we'll talk about later, all right? The Hajj, uh, every Muslim is supposed to one time in their life go and visit Mecca. So it's a very interesting example of how a pre-Islamic site has just been folded in, much like in Christianity, right? When pagan important sites were simply turned into saints. Um, you have things like the Virgin de Guadalupe, um, all kinds of, we call this religious syncretism, all right? And it's a little less common in Islam, but it happens with every religion, all right? Whenever there is a site of religious power, it is very uncommon that that site becomes completely unpowerful, much more common that it's simply turned into something else. All right, we'll talk more about the Kaaba in a moment. Here, of course, is uh, a map of modern-day Saudi Arabia, and you see Mecca down there. Hmm, and there is Medina. Now, eventually, the Meccans gang up, okay, and they force uh, Muhammad to flee. Now, the flight from Mecca is generally seen as the beginning of Islam, all right? Before this, it didn't really sort of have a name, didn't really have a group around it, but the people who are forced to flee with Muhammad to Medina are known as the first Muslims. Now, um, Hijrah, all right, the leaving. Basically, uh, when he gets to Medina, all right, Medina was having this problem, and he was having a problem between various different religious groups in the city. And here we see Muhammad really doing what he's very good at, all right, negotiating between these groups, and he's able to bring a good deal of peace to the city. So the people of Medina like Muhammad, all right, because when you have fighting like this, right, nobody gets to make money, and everyone likes to make money. So Muhammad is able to settle this dispute between these two other groups. And in exchange in Medina, the Medinans say, okay, you know, you wanna practice your new religion, you know, you can kind of, uh, you know, do whatever you want. Now, over the following years, all right, followers of Muhammad begin to grow in popularity. And again, Islam at this point offered a very structured sort of a life in a very chaotic world, all right? It offered people um, sort of these, these relatively simple rules, um, a healthy lifestyle, and I think that was very appealing to people, right, in this chaotic and violent world. Now, Eventually, and I'm not gonna really push on dates here, but just to understand, um, eventually Muhammad builds up an army. And one of the things that Muhammad is able to do, one of the largest breakthroughs in all of Islam, 
is that Muhammad is able to convert the Bedouin warriors. Now these are the biggest and the baddest warriors on the whole peninsula. And when they convert to Islam, all right, it is a major turning point for the religion. Now, Muhammad goes back to Mecca. All right, he's got this big army and the Meccans just give up. They're like, okay, no. He then goes in, all right, he purges the Kaaba of the idols. Okay, and it still remains, again, a central site in Islam. It simply transitioned, transitioned from being uh, a pagan site of worship to being a Muslim site of worship. Okay, so real quickly, we're just gonna go through these. Again, um, I just, I want you to have some kind of religious literacy about Islam, about what it means. It's, an, it's a complex religion like all religions. And what I'm gonna talk about here is just the basics. So this isn't how it's practiced in different parts of the world, which will end up being quite different. Um, this is just your, your basic brass tacks, okay? So the main concepts in Islam are considered uh, the five pillars of faith, all right? So first of all, uh, faith, all right? Um, this pillar, okay, generally you must accept monotheism. All right, Islam is a fiercely monotheistic religion. All right, a part very different from Christianity, Islam does not believe in even graven images. All right, even images of Muhammad, images of God, those are all um, out of bounds. All right, Islam does not have anything like the Trinity. It believes that the Trinity violates the basic principle of monotheism. So, all right. There's no God but Allah. Muhammad is his prophet. All right. And again, the relationship between Muhammad and God is different than God and Jesus. Okay. Muhammad is not, uh, he, he's just a man. All right. He is not divine in any way. Islam does not believe that there are half man, half gods. All right. Jesus in Islam is just another prophet. Now, prayer. All right, Muslims are uh, required to pray, pray five times a day, all right, to mark the passage of the day from dawn until they go to sleep, basically. Uh, Muslims pray in the direction of Mecca, all right? So for the most part, if you're in the United States, that is east. Um, ritual prayer, again, is part of sort of um, marking out your day, all right? Uh, giving thanks to God. Now, you also have fasting, all right? Uh, Muslims mark the time that Muhammad would spend in the cave where he got the revelation from the angel Gabriel um, with a holiday, all right, called Ramadan. And during Ramadan, uh, Muslims generally fast from sunup to sundown. Uh, there are ritual meals. Um, and again, the fasting is to help you um, be thankful for what you have, help you understand that there are people all over the world that are starving, right? Um, and it's one of the main holidays uh, of Islam. Now, Muslims are required to give alms, all right? One of the things that um, Muhammad did not like, right, was this huge separation between rich and poor and that rich people wouldn't help poor people. So um, you are generally required to give part of your earnings every year, all right, to uh, your mosque, and the mosque then uh, disperses that among the community of people who might need it. Um, mosques do a lot of work uh, in terms of soup kitchens, in terms of all kind of modern stuff, right? Helping kids get uh, books and coats and shoes, and there's a lot of charitable work um, that is folded into Islam. A final pillar is the Hajj. Um, every Muslim um, is supposed to one time in their life make a pilgrimage to Mecca. In the most traditional sense, what you do is you shave your head and you wear your burial shroud, the shroud that you will be buried in after you're dead. Now at Mecca itself, 
you do a series of uh, ritual walkings in various different kinds of directions. And the whole point of the Hajj is that you go there and you understand that despite the differences in race, um, there really aren't differences between any of us because we're all going to look the same when we're dead in the ground. And that seems a little grim, but it's really kind of a happy thought, right? It also means that the juxtaposition of that is that we all look the same in the eyes of God. Um, famous people who've gone on the Hajj, Malcolm X, all right, went on the Hajj and had a sort of a revelation um, about the oneness of humanity. Uh, Islam is a religion that preaches the oneness of all peoples, at least on this base level, okay? So these are the basic concepts. Um, they go a million different directions like all uh, religions do, right? And Islam expands into different parts of the world, all right? Different kinds of practices uh, emerge. <clears throat> okay, so again, we'll just go over these quickly. Um, one God, all right? Same God as the Jews, same God as the Christians. Um, if you want, you can think about Islam as just like the last chapter in a story. Now, to be fair, Jews and Christians don't really think there needs to be another chapter, right? So there, I don't mean to imply that there has to be, but it is a particularly interesting kind of a narrative, right? Islam isn't saying these other things are wrong. It's just saying, you know, they were the first chapters and were the last ones. It's very similar to the way that Christians um, look at Judaism, basically, right? Old Testament, New Testament, whole kind of thing. This is a profession of faith. All right, we saw earlier, okay. Um, and again, basically this is a very strict monotheism and, you know, Allah is in charge. All right, this is a five times a day of prayer. If you've ever been in a Muslim country, you will often hear what they call the call to prayer. Um, most uh, mosques, at least in the larger cities, right, have a minaret, a large skinny tower, and people will go up in the tower and there's a call to prayer, it's a particular kind of song. And um, it's quite striking. Um, I've only ever been in uh, two Muslim countries. I've been to Tunisia and Morocco, and it really does, uh, it's, it's striking if you've never uh, been in a society quite like that before, but I, I recommend it. It's, it's fascinating. Um, again, um, almsgiving, um, various different ways, uh, including not just sort of giving money, but giving all kinds of things, giving your time, um, debt forgiveness, uh, getting prisoners out, all kinds of different things have expanded into generally sort of the concept of almsgiving, right? That if you have enough, um, you should help people that don't. So I think it's a, it's a solid concept. All right, again, uh, giving alms, something that's pretty familiar to these other religious traditions. Okay. I know we're going fast here, but we got a lot of other stuff to do. All right, Ramadan, the obligatory month uh, of fasting, again. Um, and, you know, a lot of different parts about it, right? Again, it's meant to uh, attach you physically to people that don't have enough to eat, all right? To make you understand, um, Sort of how that feels. And again, to break down the barriers that we put up between ourselves and other people, right? I'm not a poor person. I'm not a starving person. Well, in God's view, according to Muslims, right, we're all sort of the same people. Finally, the Hajj. Again, um, you know, go to the Black Meteorite do some things, see Muslims from all around the world, understand 
uh, the oneness of humanity. Uh, millions of people a year uh, make the Hajj, as you can imagine, uh, with a lot of Muslims in the world, right? It, it uh, is a pretty big, uh, pretty wild thing. Okay. Now, a lot of these other sort of simple rules, all right, uh, much like our Jewish brothers and sisters, there is a prohibition on eating pork, um, largely because, you know, pigs aren't the cleanest creatures in the world. Uh, that's largely adapted uh, from the Judeo world. Um, there are attempts at controlling sexuality as there are with any religion. Um, a lot of these, you know, come up in these different kinds of ways. Um, the Sharia, all right, or the law that will govern everything, um, is different in different places, all right? Um, men and women generally in mosques are kept separate, and women are required to wear a head covering. Um, now, this varies a great deal. Right in Afghanistan, women are required to wear an entire uh, burqa. Right, it covers their entire uh, body basically. Um, that's very radical. Many other places simply have uh, something that covers a woman's hair. Um, this is something that evolves in different ways in different places. All right, no drinking of alcohol. Uh, one of the things that Muhammad saw throughout his world was that there was a great deal of intoxication and he felt it never led to anything good. So all of these rules basically, or a lot of them, come out of either Judaism and Christianity or the world in which Islam was born. Now, does every Muslim follow them? Of course not. Okay, we're at a very basic level here. Um, but that's what we're doing. Now, like uh, Judaism and Christianity, all right, Islam believes in a day of judgment. Um, for Muslims, right, they believe in the book, the mighty book, and the book has all of your actions over your entire life. And as you will come before God in judgment, he will open the book, and he will read all of your deeds. And if you're, you know, a good person, all right, you get to go into this wonderful garden. Um, and if you're a bad person, you'll go to hell. Hell's pretty much like a Christian hell. All right, uh, tormented by demons, boiling water, noxious food, separation from Allah. Um, Muslims do believe that your actions in this world will determine your place in the next one. Uh, they also believe that while Allah is in entirely a forgiving God, he is also a judgmental one. Allah gives you many, many opportunities throughout your life to do the right thing. So if you don't, okay, I don't know why I have this slide here, so I'm going to move on. Okay, now, obviously, all right, these religions do have differences. Um, and again, the major differences are just that Islam views itself as the last chapter in a story. All right, so the Torah, Abraham, Moses, the covenant, all those things in the first chapter. Then you have Jesus, um, the gospels, all that. That's the second chapter, and Muhammad's the final chapter. So Jews and Christians are people of the book because they believe in those other two books. But, you know, Muslims still think that they are incorrect in some things. Um, a big one for Islam, right, is that they do not accept any sort of idea of the Trinity or of Jesus being God's son. So uh, to them, right, the Quran sort of corrects all the mistakes of these other traditions. Now, the night passage to Jerusalem. Uh, one of the more controversial aspects uh, in Islam is that 
later on, okay, we have this story that is added to Islam. Now, all religions have this, okay? Remember that the Gospels were written 100 years after Jesus' death. Uh, the Torah is written over more than 1,000 years. So I, I say it's later. I'm not trying to say it's not right. It's just something that happens in religions. So we get this, this story. So Muhammad says that in a vision, right, he was carried from the Kaaba to this location in Jerusalem, which today we call the Temple Mount. All right. And there he ascends up into heaven through the seven layers of heaven. Now, through this story, all right, Islam is tying Muhammad into all the Jewish prophets and to Jesus. So he meets these great biblical figures, Moses, Aaron, Jack, Jesus, John the Baptist, Abraham, and enters the very presence of God. All right. Um, and so this happens. Um, now, largely, all right, he wanted Islam to be centered in Jerusalem. Uh, that was problematic is problematic, all right? There are already Jews in Jerusalem, there are Christians in Jerusalem. Um, and so it became Mecca that was the center of Islam and not Jerusalem, all right? And that becomes later, uh, it becomes important later during the Crusades, right? One of the reasons that the Christians are able to come over and snatch Jerusalem away is because it's not really a center of Islam until after the Crusades. Now, the location where Muhammad has his, his ascension up to heaven, all right, is this beautiful building uh, called the Dome of the Rock. Now, the Dome of the Rock is literally built on top of what is left of the second temple, all right, which is a very sacred site uh, for Jewish people, all right? It's the Temple of King David, um, mostly destroyed. But uh, what we call the Wailing Wall, right, right on the other side of this mosque. So as you can imagine, this causes some troubles. Um, but Dome of the Rock built in 691, all right, in the Umayyad Caliphate, uh, one of the very important and powerful caliphates in which uh, Islam is going to spread over most of the ancient world. Now, because um, Islam does not believe in graven images, right? No pictures, no saints, no angels, nothing like that. Their architecture is very different than you would have at a Christian church. All right. So we have basically different kinds of symmetrical sorts of designs. Um, we then, as you can see around the top there, have uh, writings or surahs from the Quran. Um, which are all over, it's just a little map uh, showing uh, the different parts of ancient Jerusalem. All right, there you can see the Dome of the Rock, the Western Wailing Wall. Um, again, this is a very conflicted part of the world as Jerusalem is in general. It's a beautiful city though. Okay, more pictures of the Dome of the Rock. Um, okay, more pictures of the Dome of the Rock. You can go through these uh, at your leisure. Again, they're quite beautiful. Um, but we got to get on here. Okay, now Islam, all right, uh, begins to expand. All right, and one of the reasons that Islam expands so quickly, okay, um, is that it's a particular time period in which there is no big other empire in the world. All right, the Roman Empire, except for a little bit there at Constantinople and Byzantium isn't very strong. Um, and there's just open space for empires to expand. And Islam, gave people, again, a very ordered life. Um, and once they started winning, everyone likes to be on the winning side. So people were able to convert um, large swaths 
of the Middle East, all right? The Persians, um, the people of North Africa, um, the people of all parts of Asia Minor going out into the Balkans. All right, and Islam grows very, very quickly. Now, as we're gonna talk about uh, in a different lecture, if you look over there in Spain, all right, in 711, uh, Muslim forces cross the Straits of Gibraltar and they fight all the way up into Southern France where they are finally defeated by Charles the Hammer Martel, who is the grandfather of Charlemagne. Ooh, those are good lectures and they're coming in just a little bit. But um, Muslims are going to remain in Spain from 711 until 1492. And the Spanish experience with Islam is particularly culturally rich and wonderful. And I'm gonna do a whole lecture on it. Okay, so we're gonna talk about uh, a few more of these questions. I know this is a long lecture, but um, we're almost there. Don't worry. Okay. Um, so as, Islam grew in power, all right, um, he had more trouble with other religions. Just happens. Um, and we can read a little bit more. These aren't super important. Okay, the big important thing to talk about, all right, is that Islam, as it was set up under Muhammad, never really agreed on how to choose a successor once he was gone. And with most religions and even kings, right, that is super problematic. Um, because usually with kings, I say the funny thing, if they need an heir and a spare, all right? With religions, they all go through this period. I mean, Judaism, not so much, but Christianity and Islam all go through this confusing period, right? After the main person, Jesus or Muhammad, is gone, who's in charge now? Okay? So... The first caliph, all right, and caliph and caliphate are terms that we get all scared with now, but a caliph is just a leader and a caliphate is just the, the, the bit of uh, territory over which he rules. So the first caliph is Abu Bakr, all right, one of his good friends. And Abu Bakr rules over a relatively productive period for Islam. Again, Islam is expanding out. And yes, it's expanding through military expansion, but a lot of people are converting to Islam and it's not at the point of a sword, all right? Islam is really giving people something that they want. They want order, they want structure, and Islam is giving that to them. Now, Abu Bakr rules for a while um, and then dies. So we have basically four caliphs, all right? Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. Now, we're not gonna go into super big detail here. You can read about these guys. They all did um, interesting things, all right? In the construction of orthodoxy in Islam, right? Orthodoxy is just the proper way, you know, you do things. Um, and they oversaw the great expansion um, of Islam throughout the world. Now, one of the things you have during these early periods, all right, is struggle for who's in control. And with Abu Bakr, right, we had some of these other tribes that wanted to break away. He conquered those tribes, okay? He forgave them. All right. Um, under Umar, all right, we see this relatively brief period, um, Islam expands throughout Asia Minor, all right? Now, the other thing that's lucky for Islam is that the Byzantine Empire is really kind of on its last legs, all right? Um, Constantinople is going to hold out for some time, for another 700 years, but <clears throat> again, there aren't big empires that are on either side of Islam. So places like the Mediterranean, Middle East, all right, Syria, Egypt is weak. 
all of these places, all right, are basically expanding. Now this term here, the UMA, all right, the UMA refers to the international community of Muslims all around. Another term here, jihad, right? We're all tittery about jihad. Now jihad again means a holy war. Um, the Quran tells us is there's the big jihad and the little jihad. And the big jihad is the one that we all fight inside ourselves, all right? In order to try to be good, righteous Muslims and to deny sin. The little jihad is a term that refers to protecting the international ummah from attack. Um, so you can't just start a war on anybody, and especially not if they're Jews or Christians. Um, jihad references wars either of religious expansion, okay, or in response to attacks in the Ummah. Now that concept has of course been stretched probably far beyond its basic usefulness, but again, that happens a lot in religion, right? And you can see the cartwheels um, that various kinds of Christians do to do particular actions. So uh, this is the basis of that term. Basically, jihad is a holy war largely against uh, pagans, all right? Pagans are about the only people you can really just set out after and, and just kick their butt. Now, under Umar, all right, Islam expands to basically that map that I showed you uh, before. Um, now, the other thing that the Muslim empires are really good at, all right, is administration. They're well run. They give people a reason to convert to Islam, all right? The stability that follows conversion uh, increases your trade markets, all right? It cuts down on crime. It does all these good things. Um, and basically, all right, under Umar, Islam expands. Whoa. All right, Uthman. Now, the Umayyads, all right, are probably some of the most wealthy and powerful uh, clans of Islam, all right? And basically, once the Umayyads are finally um, converted to Islam, all right, this takes uh, Islam all the way up through Syria, all right, very powerful parts of the ancient Middle East, and it greatly increases their wealth, all right? So now they have all the trading powers of trading throughout the Mediterranean, all right? They have the caravans coming over with spices, and once that is more of a unified whole, all right, it becomes um, very, very wealthy. Now, these guys you're not going to have to know a ton uh, about, but just understand that the first four people after Muhammad, all right, we have a relatively steady transition. Um, but this problem remains that there's no religious law that tells people how to choose the next successor. And so that means that there are always people kind of plotting in the wings, right? Now, under the Umayyads, right, this dynasty grows to be absolutely huge. And sometimes there are problems with that. All right, we have these revolts that break out. Um, we have some chaos, some fighting. Then we get to Ali. Now, what we're going to have after the Caliphate of Ali, all right, is the last thing we'll talk about, the biggest split in Islam. Okay, before this, Islam had been made up of lots of different parts, but had all basically believed um, the same thing. Now, under Ali, we get this major problem and split. All right, um, Ali is eventually murdered. And ooh, pictures of the Quran. 
we have to talk about this. All right, so again, as we've talked about, okay, a caliph is basically a successor to the prophet. Um, now, originally, all right, these caliphs had been people who had known the prophet, all right, um, or people who were from those families of people who had known the prophet. But obviously, as we get further away uh, from Muhammad, that is going to be less and less possible, okay? So, 632, all right, uh, Muhammad dies. So as we've talked about, we have these other caliphs, all right? We have Abu Bakr, uh, we have Ali. Now the big split here, okay, between Abu Bakr and Ali is, should a caliph have to be related by blood to Muhammad? Now Ali is Muhammad's cousin, Okay, Abu Bakr is his great friend and mentor, but not related to him. All right, so there begin to be these opposing groups. Now, the majority of people in the Islamic world, both then and now, believed that the system of caliph um, was just fine. Okay, that you didn't have to be related to Muhammad, uh, that there could be even a democratic process for electing a caliph. Some people stuck with Ali and wanted that bloodline to continue, all right? That was a very important idea in the ancient world. So again, um, this split emerges, okay? This is the split in Islam today, all right? Between Sunnis and Shia. Now, what do these terms mean? Last thing we'll talk about. I know this is a long one, all right? Um, so everyone likes the next three caliphs or so, okay? Uh, they were well supported. They dealt with a few revolts, but they oversee this massive expansion of Islam and they do a pretty good job. All right. And these men, again, knew Muhammad. They knew how he worked. And so their question were always, what does the Quran tell me? And what did I learn from Muhammad himself? Pretty simple. Ah, well, that one looked weird down there. But anyway, these are called the rightly guided caliphs in the history of Islam. No. Okay. Now. Most people... All right, within the world. Now these slides are starting to look all stupid and I'm sorry. Uh, most people accepted, all right, this succession because it promoted the stability which had made everything good in the first place, all right? The Umayyads um, made everybody money, they made the world safe, they expanded Islam, and in general, all right, their leadership was okay at first. All right, now, there is a small group uh, within Islam, all right, who are called the Shia, which means the party of Ali. Now, these were the people who thought that the caliphs, all right, the successors should be related by blood to Muhammad. Okay, uh, the other group, the majority, the vast majority, all right, were known as the Sunni. Okay, we may call themselves, right, the follower of Muhammad's example. Now, this is still a split in Islam today. Uh, the majority of Muslims in the world are Sunni, all right? The main Shia power is Iran. And that focuses on a basic power dynamic within the Muslim world, um, in which at first, right, uh, the Arabs of the Arabian Peninsula were dominant in the Muslim empire. Uh, we next have the ascension of the Persians, all right, and struggles ensue. So again, uh, Shiites are only 15% of all Muslims, but um, their basic belief, all right, um, is that 
the leader of Islam should be related to the prophet by blood. They also believe that qualified religious leaders have the authority to interpret the Sharia. So in Iran, right, we have a theocracy there um, in which the mullahs there are, are largely in charge of the country. Now the Sunnis on the other hand, all right, about 85% of all Muslims, um, and basically they believe, right, that leaders should be chosen through a consensus of religious leaders. And Sunnis in general are more conservative about adding things to the Sharia, the law. They basically think that the law was codified and done by the 10th century. There's nothing new in there. And you can use that to interpret the world around us. So there are a million different interpretations that spin off of these two points of view. Only thing that's important for us to really understand is that the Sunnis are generally the majority of Muslims in the world and uh, Shiites um, are a smaller minority. All right, this is just, uh, you know, a little graph about these differences we just talked about. Uh, here we can see, again, um, the majority of Muslims in the world, as that map clearly shows, right, uh, are Sunni. The Sunni Shia split uh, is still as fierce as it was uh, in the seventh century today. Um, we have had wars, uh, largely the Iran-Iraq war, uh, fighting in Afghanistan and Pakistan between Sunnis and Shias. All right, this is still uh, a very sharp divide. It is even more, I would say so, than sort of Protestants and Catholics within Christianity. Um, and, you know, as with anything else, right, you put uh, violence with something and it can become quite uh, unfortunate. Now, again, uh, Shia uh, has a particular time within the empire of Islam in which the Persians really sort of grow to power and then fade again. Um, largely the main Shia power in the world today is Iran. Final thing we'll talk about, just to have uh, a little something at the end here, um, are Sufis. Now, Sufis are sort of mystical um, Muslims. And basically, they strive to have a closer connection with Allah. And uh, largely, this involves various kinds of art, various kinds of dancing. Um, Sufis largely live sort of uh, more isolated or monastic lives, all right? Uh, a good example, which I'll post a video, is of the whirling dervishes, right? Who believe that through uh, reciting particular surahs of the Quran and twirling and dancing in a particular way, all right, you can literally get an experience of being closer to God. Um, Sufis in the Muslim world, some people look down upon them. Uh, some people think that they're just sort of uh, like radical hippies or they're just doing something kind of crazy. Um, but they exist uh, throughout the world of Islam. They're just another sort of uh, diverse um, particular way. All right. Um, again, we have traditions like this in Christianity and Judaism, basically every religion, right? this mystical means of chanting, of changing your reality, of trying to get closer uh, to God, exists in almost all faiths. Okay, so I hope um, that you have um, 
enjoyed. I hope this has been somewhat helpful. All right, I know there's some other information um, on this week. Um, again, look at that uh, Al Andalus uh, video, and I will talk a little bit more about Muslims in Spain. Um, I hope that you're all doing well. I hope you're all staying safe. And uh, again, if you have other questions uh, or concerns about uh, the work that's coming up, uh, please be in touch via email. This, yes, well, this is a spread of Islam. All right, early on. Again, it's important to think about the fact that there was no real empire in their way, right? If they would have tried to spread like this through the Roman Empire, I think it would have been harder. But because Rome had already fallen, they spread more easily. Here's the Sunni and Shia split. All right, you can see the Shia is a dark color right around Iran, a little bit in Iraq and some other places. Um, and, you know, Sunni sort of uh, dominates. The most number of Muslims in the world actually live in Indonesia. And again, as Islam spread through places like India and Southeast Asia, all right, it takes on the flavors of wherever it grows, just like any religion will. All right, I know that was long, uh, but again, I thought it was important for us to just try to, to get a base uh, for starting to uh, think about Islam a little bit uh, for this part of our class, all right? So I hope you guys are all doing well and I will come uh, with another lecture in a little bit.